take your Bible this evening and go to Psalm 46. Would you please? Psalm 46. Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the, with the swelling thereof, Selah. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. The heathen raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease under the ends of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear asunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Be still, and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Father, add your blessing here to the reading of the scripture tonight, and Father, as we prepare to uh, focus on your admonition that we be still and know that you are God. That you'd help us tonight to glean the truths that you would have us to glean from this passage of Scripture. And uh, Lord, that you would minister to the hearts of your people this evening as only you can. Holy Spirit of God, help me to make the message clear. Help, Lord, as you as your word is taught that you'll go up and down these aisles and in and out of these rows and that you'll stop at every occupied seat and you'll minister to your people this evening your words. And Lord, help us tonight to understand the precious truth of being still and knowing that you are God. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Be still. <clears throat> Be still. You ever heard... You ever heard of the term circuit riding preacher? You know, circuit riders, they were men back in the 1700s, 1800s that were, uh, they would ride from church to church, but most of the time they rode that on horseback. And uh, they would ride around and preach services and maybe uh, pastor several different churches going from congregation to congregation. Well, the story goes, one day a circuit riding preacher was riding uh, out and the man, saw a man working in his field. And he wanted to start a conversation and invite the man to come to church. And said, fine day, isn't it? Man in the field said, fine day for you. Said, what do you mean? He said, well, all you have to do is ride around on that horse all day and think about God. I have to sweat here in the field and then walk home afterwards. I don't think it's right that you have it so easy. Why well, I have to have it so hard. Hmm, preacher said, you're right. You do work hard in the field. And I admire you for your hard work. But you need to realize the kind of work I do is kind of difficult as well. Guy said, yeah, sure. It's not really work. All you do is ride around and think about God all the time. That's not hard. Preacher said, you know, it may be harder than you think. And the fellow says, what do you mean? He said, I'll tell you what. He says, just to prove to you how difficult it can be to think about God. He said, I, I, I want you to think about God and nothing else. For one minute. And if you can do that, I'll give you my horse. Guy said, you're kidding me. He said, no, no, I'm serious. Man said, you're on. And so he sat down right there on the ground in silence. The preacher waited. Ten seconds. Some of you have a hard time, aren't you? 20 seconds. He got to 25 seconds. And the farmer said, hey, does that include the saddle? Mm-hmm. Now, some of you get it. Uh, he wasn't just thinking about God, was he? You see, it's harder than you think. 
be still and know that I am God. Sounds like, sounds like God's asking us to be still. Hmm? Sounds like just be quiet in his presence and know he is God. But you know, a lot of people have a hard time doing that. A lot of you, for those 20 seconds, you thought it was forever. Oh, that's a long time. You've heard the saying, nature abhors a vacuum. A lot of people abhor silence. They can't stand for it just to be quiet. They'll do just about anything to fill that void. Some people, they get in a car, they won't get in the car without the radio coming on. Or the cassette player, the CD player beginning to work. Something, some, some noise while they're driving. There's people who you know and I know, uh, they get up in the morning and the TV goes on. They don't necessarily have to watch it, they just want the noise all day long. And it doesn't go off till they go to bed at night. And they just have noise uh, in their house. I can't tell you the last time that I knocked on a door soul winning and the TV wasn't on. It's always on. And, and, and it's, uh, it, it, people used to go, they would run to think and to clear their mind. Now they run and they put these little things in their ears. Huh? Yeah, in their earbuds. And they have something going all the time. Got to have sound. Got to have music. And we get it everywhere we go, don't we? You go to the store, there's music. You go to the restaurant, there's music. You're, or there's televisions. Huh. Now just about anywhere you go. I don't remember the last time... Yeah, remember the last time we went to a restaurant and there wasn't some screen to look at? You know? Uh, always noise. Always something going on. People feel like they need to fill every waking moment with something. But God says, be still. You know what God says? I like silence. I like silence. Be silent before Him. Now, when He says be still, still means this. Still means to stop as in motion or agitation. It means to check or to restrain. It means to make quiet. It means to be silent, uttering no sound. It means quiet, calm. It means not disturbed by noise. Be still and know that I am God. When's the last time you were just still? Hmm? Just still. Several things I'll point out to you tonight. Four simple things. Number one, be still means to be comfortable in God's presence. When you're still, it means you're comfortable in God's presence. You know, uh, people feel comfortable being silent when they're in the presence of somebody who they feel comfortable with. When you're with someone that you're comfortable with, it's... It's, it's easy and it's okay that you don't talk a lot. You just are together. Remember? Uh, you, ever, you ever watch a, a, a young people maybe out on a date? Or, or maybe when you were younger and you called them on the phone? Hmm? And there were times, long periods of times when nobody said anything. You were just there. You were just together. You were just with each other. Husband and wife can be that way. You can sit in the same room during an evening and maybe one reading and somebody else doing something. And you, don't, you don't say a whole lot, but you're together. You're with one another. And you're comfortable with that. God says, I want you to be comfortable in my presence. And the truth is, you're not, you're not always comfortable in God's presence. You learn to be comfortable in God's presence. You learn to be settled. You're not... You're not nervous. You know what happens when people get nervous when they're around certain people? They, they talk. And they chatter. And they do because they're nervous. Sometimes when you're nervous, it, you're, you, 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 think, you think times of silence are really forever. And, you don't, and so you're not sure what to say, so you say something. You're kind of like Peter on the Mount of Transfiguration when he saw Moses and Elijah. He figured, I better say something. It's awful quiet. See? And he said something that wasn't real smart, okay? And, uh, he, and sometimes we get that way. The way to be comfortable around God is to be quiet. Practice being quiet in his presence. You know, 
if you remember, some of you have young children. Some of you have grown children. Remember when you're young children, okay? And uh, there are times when they were small, and they would come and uh, get up. Brother Dave, uh, Terry has a, does she have it? Who has it? Philemon has it, okay. Want to make sure she gets that now that they're here? Welcome. Okay, he's got your outline, Lana, okay? All right, very good. Okay, Alma, all right. Now, where were we? Talking about kids and how sometimes kids, and, and, and they'll want to get up in your lap, and you know what they want to do? Just talk, 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 talk. They're not, in fact, sometimes you're not sure what all they're saying, but they're just saying it and letting you know all about what's going on. Sometimes they want to ask you for something. Sometimes they'll just uh, say something that may be bothering. But, you know, sometimes kids just get up in your lap and they just want to sit there. They just want to cuddle. And that's, that's okay. That's all right. love it when little Lana comes up and just holds and then she lays her head on your shoulder. Oh, that's pretty good right there. And that's nice. And just they just want to be held. Remember, maybe... Remember what it felt like to have your child do that? That was nice. That was enjoyable. You know, there's it, that, it, it, in that moment, the child is saying, I love you, I trust you, I feel safe with you. You ever, you ever picture yourself just getting up into God's lap and saying, God, I just want to be close to you. I just want to be near you. I just want to sit here with you. Not to, not to chatter, not to talk. I'm not, listen, certainly, uh, certainly prayer is asking. And there's nothing, certainly nothing wrong. And God encourages us to ask for what we need in prayer. In fact, he said you have not because you ask not. So nothing's wrong with, with asking. And I'm not saying that don't ask when you, when you pray. But there ought to be sometimes when you just say, God, I just want to be with you. I just want to be close to you. I'm not here to, to get something from you. I just want to be with you. Being comfortable. That's what being still means. Being comfortable in the presence of God. I mean, you, some of you have adult children that, that do not still live with you, okay? And, and if, you, if you never hear from them except when they want something, then every time the phone rings, your first question is, what do you want? What do you want now? Right? Because that's the only time you ever hear from them. Well, I wonder if, if, and God's not like that, but I wonder if he ever would say that to you or me. Well, what do you want now? Instead of knowing that we just want to be with him. We just want to be close to him. We're not coming just to ask and just to get something, but we just want to be in the presence of God. And, and I want to get to where I'm comfortable with that and not nervous about that. You know, I remember a preacher telling a story <clears throat> that when he was younger, um, his father, I think they said they lived in a mobile home park, and his dad ran the park. And he said every Saturday morning uh, he would had a big trailer that he would take all the trash and they'd go to the dump. And he said, this one particular Saturday morning, some of the other boys in the trailer park were uh, getting ready to <coughs> play some baseball. And they had a ball and bats and everything out there. And so uh, he said, hey, son, you going to go with me to the dump? And he I think I'm going to stay and play ball. Okay, all right. Well, one of the other boys said, I'll go with you. He said, sure, come on. He jumped in the truck, and they went off to the dump, gone for several hours. But when they got back early that afternoon, he pulled up, and, and they got out of the truck, and guess what that little boy had? He had an ice cream cone. And the owner's son, this preacher, who's not a preacher, his dad, uh, he, he come running up, and he said, hey, hey, that's my ice cream cone. <laughs> and dad said, no, it's not. You didn't want to go with me. You didn't want to go along with me. Uh, he just wanted to come along with me. And as a, as a, by the way, as a result, 
I gave him an ice cream cone. Well, and the preacher said, you know, he said, I never missed another Saturday the rest of the time <laughs> that uh, we lived there. I always wanted to go with Dad. Now, it's, and by the way, didn't always get an ice cream cone, but it, it, he wanted to be with Dad. You know, you ever just want to be with God? You ever just want to be with Him? Not, to, not because, Lord, I need something. Lord, I'm, I'm coming to you because I'm really in a mess. Sometimes we have to do that, sure. But isn't there times we just ought to come to God and say, God, I just want to be with you for a while? See, it's being comfortable in his presence. All right? Number two, being still means that I will know God is my refuge. Verse one, <clears throat> God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. A refuge is that which shelters or protects from danger, distress, or calamity. <clears throat> it's a stronghold which protects by its strength. I like this. Any, it's any place inaccessible to the enemy. God is our refuge. Isn't that amazing? And, and if He's our refuge in God, we're inaccessible to the enemy. Boy, that's good news. So God, I'll know God's my refuge. Now, this is a very foundational principle. He's starting the psalm off with that, with that thought. That's, that's the foundation of the whole psalm, verse 1. He's our refuge. He's our strength. He's our very present help in trouble. And the question is this, do you believe that? Do you believe what he said right there? That God is our refuge. God is our strength. He's a very present help in trouble. If you believe that, and you'll trust that promise, and you'll trust that principle, several things fall into place as you look at this psalm. All right? <coughs> Notice what he said. Therefore will not we fear. Well, what do you, what do you got to fear? Look what's going to happen. Though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Mountains begin to shake, they're moved into the sea. The earth is moving. It's a, that, whether this is earthquake time or what it, what's going on, but I tell you what, there's going to be a lot of people be scared to death if that was taking place. But God says, you won't be. If the Lord's your refuge and the Lord's your strength. When the thing that, that, that people trust in the most, with the thing that they seem is most secure, fails them, then we don't have to fear. You know, when people's false security proves to be just that, false security, they're going to panic. We saw it. Uh, listen, the, the, this country saw it back in 1929 when the stock market crashed. That which people put their security in, that's, and it became false security, they were leaping out of the building. Life's over. Nothing to live for. And you think, oh, that won't happen again. Well, we just went over 22,000 today. A lot of people putting all their faith in that stock market. And uh, I, I believe in the adage that what goes up must come down. And it will. And that's not what you put your trust in. And so... He uses uh, some very powerful imagery here to talk about how difficult things could get. Notice, notice he goes on in verse number uh, uh, 4. He says, there's a, there's a river. The streams thereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, and shall not, she shall not be moved. God shall help her in that right early. Oh, he talks about the waters roaring and being troubled in verse 3 and contrasts that with the calm river in verse number 4 and 5. A raging sea destroys things. A raging uh, a river uh, will bring death, but a calm river brings life. A calm river builds things. And so it's, it's, a, it's a completely different. God, God can take things that were meant for evil and turn them to good. He's our refuge. That's why we trust Him. 
Because he can, he can take those things that seem evil, like we talked about Joseph on Sunday night, and he can turn them into good. And he can turn things around for us. God is with her. She shall not be moved. God is present. When the earth trembles, the mountains move, the seas rage and, 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 and foams, and there's trouble and there's storms, God is our refuge. He's a very present help in time of trouble. Well, what about, what, what's going to happen with North Korea? And what's going to happen with Iran? And what's Russia up to anyway? And we think all these things are going on in the world, and what's going to take place? You know what? That doesn't worry me one bit. That's not an issue at all. You know why? God's my refuge and my strength. He's a very present help in time of trouble. Everything is just like God says it will be, and God will take care of His own. Be still and know that I am God. It means I'm comfortable in His presence. It means I know He's my refuge. Now here's one for us, number three. Be still means I don't have to figure it all out. I don't have to figure it all out. Being still, being quiet means not only with my mouth, but with my mind and with my spirit as well. Be still and know that He is God. You notice God's not calling you to figure it out? He didn't say be still and you'll know all the answers. Be still and write down all the things you think you think so you'll know what's going on. No, just be still and know that He is God. And He's God and God can do whatever He wants. And He doesn't need my approval. He doesn't need my permission. You think that's simple. Try doing it. When things are rough, when, when it feels like your world is, is in an upheaval and everything's falling apart or everything's going wrong, you just try being quiet and not saying a word. And not only that, not just not, just, not just not saying a word with your mouth, but being calm in your mind and in your spirit. So you're not agitated, you're not looking like some, you know, the, the world's come to an end and people say, man, what's wrong with you? You look terrible. Hmm? You, can, you can be quiet with your mouth and yet be very, un, un, uh, very at, at unease in your spirit and be troubled in your spirit. So God is saying that I want to, he wants to quiet not just our mouth, but our soul and our heart as well. God didn't say, be still, and, and through your reasoning and your uh, brilliancy, you'll figure out what I'm doing. He didn't say that. He said, be still and know that what? I am God. I am God. My trust is He is God. And he knows everything. He knows everything. So just know me. Commune with God. Talk to him. Wait on him. Be still before him. He's an ever-present help in time of trouble. When we're still, we think about something. And when you think about God, you think about this. God is infinite and I am finite. He's big and I'm little. He's got everything in control. I don't have anything in control. It is all up to him. It's not up to me. You think about the things in your life over which you think you have control, and then think about the things in your life over which God has control. If you made a circle on a piece of paper of all the things, and inside that circle wrote down all the things you have control over, and then I want you to make a circle on a piece of paper and put down all the things God has control over. Who do you think has the bigger circle? <laughs> yeah, big time. Big time. And so I need not be afraid. Be still and know. You see, in silence is when we learn. 
God gave us two ears and one. As long as we're talking, all we know is what we know. How are you going to learn what someone else knows? You've got to shut your pie hole and listen. Hmm? Sorry, that's West Side lingo there, Jeff. Amen. Huh? You have to listen. And you have to listen by being silent. You don't listen while you're talking. And so in silence, we begin to learn. In silence, uh, we begin to understand. In silence, we know. And what will we know? We'll know that He is God. He doesn't say, be still and you'll know the details. He doesn't say, be still and you'll figure it out. Or be still and you'll know the reasons. He didn't say that. Not saying those things aren't un, are unimportant. I think when we go through difficulties and we go through uh, upheavals in life, we have to ask ourselves, God, what, what do you want me to learn? What are you teaching me through this? I'm not opposed to that. That's not wrong. But that's not why God says to be still. God says, You're, uh, you be still so you can know me. So you can know me. Don't just know about me. Know me. Don't be content, Christian, to know about God. Know God. Know Him. And the only way you know Him is to spend time with Him. That's the only way you get to know somebody. Be still and know that I am God. It's not the noise of our own effort that makes us grow spiritually. It's when we're quiet before the Lord. Because then we get the greatest knowledge of all. And what's that knowledge? He's God. I get to know God. Be still and know that I am God. It means I'm comfortable in His presence. It means that, that I'll know He's my refuge. My strength, a very present help in time of trouble, it means I don't have to figure it out. Why? He's got to figure it out. I don't, I don't have to fret about that. How would you, how would you feel if, if your, your child, you know, um, Bob, Isaac comes up to you. Of course, Isaac never worries about anything. Yeah. I mean, Isaac comes up and says, Dad, we got enough money for groceries this month? Dad, we, we got enough to get gas in the car this week? You would explain to him, son, that's not a concern for you. Dad's got that all taken care of. You don't have to even think about that. Hmm? You think we ever go to God and we tell him all these things and God says, what are you worrying about that for? I take care of that. You want to you wanna, you wanna take my place? Huh? No, I don't. I know sometimes people say, well, if I was God, uh -huh. you wouldn't last five seconds. God. We get, to, we get to know God. The invitation for us in Hebrews is to come boldly to the throne of grace, to come boldly into his presence. You know, the Old Testament saints, you know, when, when God, you remember when God showed up on Mount Sinai there? He told Moses, you, you put a barrier around the bottom there and nobody gets closer than that. And they were afraid to get that close. They were, it was an awful and terrible and fearful thing. But God says, not for you. I, I, I want you close. I want you to know me. You know, what the, you know what the difficulty is with most Christians today? We're content to know things about God, but we don't want to know God. Oh, come to church, preacher, tell me about God, tell me what He's like, tell me all about Him, and I go home and say, okay, I'm good. I'm good till I go next time to church and then hear more about God and, and I know all about Him. 
And that's why we have folks come in over and over into Friday Night RU who are plagued with sins and, and addictions and stubborn habits because, and who've been in church all their life because they know about God, but they don't know God. And you have to know Him. And you can't know Him if you're never quiet. If you won't be still and know that He is God. Be still. Hear that? Quiet. See? Be still. Know that I'm God. Why do you, why do you think it is that Jesus in Mark 135 rose up a great while before day and departed to a solitary place and there prayed? Hmm? Because it would, he got up early for anybody else? Got up in those wee hours of the morning? Why? Because it would be quiet and he got out to a solitary place where he'd be alone no interruptions Jesus said when we pray go into your closet and not talking about clear the shoes away and pull the, you know, not, not the closet like we know a closet but get get into a quiet place with no distractions be still and know that I am God number four be still and you'll know he's God. That's because you're still. You need to be quiet. We need to wait on God. Why do we? Hey, we have a hard time with that. I don't know if it's worldwide or whether it's American. But Americans seem to have trouble with silence. Quietness. Just, just not having noise. I don't know whether people, some people feel like it's so empty or it's meaningless or there's nothing going on or maybe if it's quiet and nothing's going on they don't think God's doing anything or God's not there. But He is. We talk about the importance of meditation. And, and, and sometimes when you say meditation people think right away about, you know, where people hum and, you know, get in weird positions and think about nothing. You know, yoga stuff. That's not, meditation isn't where you don't think about nothing, okay? Bad English, but good communication, all right? You're not, you're, you're not just thinking about anything, you're, you're nothing at all, or the art of doing nothing. God is not telling us to be still and think about nothing. What is he saying? Be still and what? Know that I'm God. He's saying, hey, be still and focus on me focus on God think about me and and keep your focus on him nature abhors the vacuum but so does the human soul and if you remember uh, Matthew Matthew did I put that in your notes did I put it in my notes yeah Matthew 12 Matthew 12 you remember this story Jesus told Matthew 12. Are you all right? Are you too warm? Too bad I can't do anything about it. Just thought I'd ask. Matthew 12, verse 43. Notice what Jesus said. Are you there? Matthew 12, 43. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. So this man had an unclean spirit. And what happened? He left. He got the unclean spirit out of him. Okay, so unclean goes around and he can't find anywhere to rest. He's saying, I will return into my house from whence I came out. So he's going back to the guy who he left. But he come, you know what happened? He found it empty, swept, and garnished. So the guy, guy got rid of the bad. He got rid of the evil spirit, but what did he put in his place? Nothing. Emptiness. Zero. So what happened? Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. See, you, you, you don't just empty. Somebody, somebody says, well, I need to clear my mind. No, you don't. You need to fill your mind with God. You need to fill your soul with God. 
You don't, you don't just empty it all out. That, that's, a, that's a vacuum. If you don't fill yourself with God, you'll fill yourself with something. It will not be empty. And you know that's true. You know, if you, if, if you don't fill, if you don't purposely fill your life with the things of God and with God Himself, other things will find their way in. And you won't keep them out. Jesus said you can't just empty yourself out and expect everything to be good. You won't like the end result. Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Would you look there with me quickly? We're almost done. Ephesians chapter 3. Paul is praying for the church at Ephesus. Notice verse 14. Ephesians 3 and verse 14. Notice he says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Here's his prayer. That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. Now, we have the Holy Spirit in verse 16. We have Christ in verse 17. Verse 19, And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be, what's the next word? Filled. Filled with what? All the fullness of God. All the fullness of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We're filled in my life. And when I'm filled up with Him, there's no room for anything else. He's all I need. Jesus Christ is made to me. All I need. All I need. Oh, Pastor, that's just a song we sing. Is it? Or is that Scripture true? We're to be filled with the fullness of God. A lady from Oklahoma named Ruth had an important decision to make. Her income as a substitute teacher was not enough to have her afford living in the apartment she'd been renting for a year. She didn't want to leave the apartment, so she started searching for a job that would provide enough income so she wouldn't have to move. She considered taking a live-in job, taking care of an elderly lady, but the family decided that they would not hire her. Time was getting short, and she was beginning to panic. But one day, she's reading the Bible in Psalm 46 and verse 10, and she reads, Be still and know that I am God. And God spoke to Ruth that day, and she said, Be still. And she said, it seems like God was telling me, take your hands off, relax. I am in control. And she did. You know, that's hard to do. Humanly speaking. When you're in situations, especially if your personality is one that you want to fix things, how many of you will admit that when somebody shares a problem with you or shares a difficulty with you, your first thoughts run, how can I fix this? Anybody like that? Yeah. And so when you face situations in life and difficulties, your wheels just start turning about things you could do or how could I get this done or how can this happen? And, and one of the most difficult things you'll do is stop it and say, I need to be still and see what God wants to do with this situation. What will God do with this? Don't, when, when everything seems to crumble around you or everything seems to be falling apart around you, listen, don't flinch from your faith in God. Don't lose that. I'm going to be still. I'm going to stand still. I'm going to be still. I'm going to be quiet. 
Say, oh, because you have self-confidence. No. Oh, you don't, when, when things are happening and you're still and you're quiet and people say, man, boy, you must have, you, you must just have seen everything so you don't, this, no, nothing shakes you anymore. No, it has nothing to do with seeing everything. But I see everything or seen nothing. It had anything to do with confidence or having seen everything or seen it all. I'm, I'm being still because what I know about God. Because I know God. And God's going to take care of things. That's what Joseph learned in Egypt. That's what, that's what David had to learn when he came back from Ziklag and, and, and they had uh, taken all the wives and children captive and burned the city with fire. And his men, his loyal men that he had, turned on him and said, I think we ought to stone David for this. You remember what, the psalm, what, what it says there in uh, 2 Samuel? He said, David encouraged himself in the Lord. David said, I got nowhere to go. I better be still. David didn't do anything until he just stopped. He didn't run to anybody else. He didn't get anybody else on the phone. He didn't go call anybody else and talk to them. He just was still quiet before God and God encouraged him. God took care of him and God showed him what to do. Listen, be still. Some of you face situations and I don't know everybody's life and I don't know everybody's situations, but I know there's situations you face and, and, and you, you, so often in our, in our society, first thing you want to do is talk to somebody or call somebody or complain to somebody and, and the thing is, here's what happens. God comes through, God takes care of it, and you're rejoicing, and all the people you went and talked to it about are still trying to figure out what to do about your problem. And it may be a week or two before you get to them and tell them that God took care of it all, but they've been a week or two fretting and worrying and trying to figure out how to help you. Just be still and know that He is God. He'll take care of us. He is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Let's pray. Let's stand together, shall we? Father, we bow before you now this evening. Thank you, Lord, for the admonition of Psalm 46. What a great psalm. I would ask you, Lord, that maybe the folks would take time tonight before they go to bed just to read that psalm over again and to see all the upheaval that takes place there and yet the foundational principle is God's our refuge and our strength. He's a very present help in time of trouble and I will simply be still and know that He is God. Whether it's a physical situation, whether it's a financial situation, whether it's living arrangements, whether it's a relationship, whatever it may be, God, may you help us as your children to be still and know that you are God. Lord, I pray you'll dismiss us now with your care. I pray, Lord, you'll make us mindful that you're with us at all times. May others see Christ in us as we live our lives for you. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Well, let's sing the windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. All right? 128 if you need it. You got it? All right, let's sing it. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garment. He gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven. And that's why I'm happy. That's why you're happy. That's why we're happy tonight. God bless you. You're dismissed. Choir, come right on up.